we are going to be talking about the portion that, start, that in English means send. And it's the sending of the 12. Now you're going, you know, I think I remember Jesus sending out 12 disciples or 12. Yes, that's right. The pattern repeats in the New Testament. Unfortunately, we will not have time to, to show all the parallels and all the repetitions uh, today because I'm going to be covering this first part. But if you want to hear more about that, that's something that we can definitely uh, go through on Wednesday night when you come for my birthday. Okay. <laughs> So, 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock. It's lighter a little bit later, so, I mean, if it starts getting darker earlier and some of the older folks need to get home earlier, that's fine. Uh, uh, that's just kind of a window, 7 to 9. Uh, we might not actually go that long. But, you know, you can talk about the Bible, you know. Some of us might be here till 10. <clears throat> I'm not saying who, but... So this, um, this is actually a prayer. It's actually from Psalm, I know it's hard to read up there, but Psalm 119, 18. And I was kind of hoping that we could say this together because what this is, is this is a prayer that we might see something out of God's word, a wonderful thing. And so uh, if you'd like to say that with me, let's all say this together. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your divine instructions. And that is what we'll hopefully do. So we've got a little bit of an outline here. First, now you might see in your Bible, if you have a heading, it might say the 12 spies. The 12 spies. Well, to me, you know, when you think of spies, you think of, you know, 007. Or maybe you think of, uh, I don't know, what, the born identity or something like that, you know, or some surreptitious thing. Um, well, actually, they're, or, you know, or they're doing something that is kind of sneaky or whatever, or, and you get kind of this negative idea about them right off the jump that they're spying out, you know, they're surreptitiously going in there. Um, and actually, they're, they're not really spies, or, they're more like scouts, right? Which means they're going to scout out things. They're going to go scout out the land and, and see what's going on in there. And so they're scouting out ahead. So they send out the 12 uh, scouts. Now, the interesting thing is the word for, in Hebrew, to send is related to the word for the sent one. It's the same, it's the same word. And the sent one is one who is an apostle. And that's how it's translated in the New Testament. So the sent one here in Hebrew is a sheliach, and the sent one that Jesus sends out is an apostle set out, sent out for a certain purpose. So these are why these things are related, because the sent ones, the sheliach, is sent on a message or on a mission for the kingdom in order to bring people into the kingdom or to see that the kingdom comes into, into being or to help people enter into the kingdom. That's the idea of the messenger or the one who is sent out. And so that... There are 12, you could say in this portion, there are 12 apostles sent out. I know that conjures up a different image in your mind as far as the English goes, but there is, it's actually the same word, apostle, shiliach in Hebrew. So then they come back and they give a report. It's kind of like, who asked your opinion anyway? I mean, we'll get into that. Uh, then the people rebel against the whole plan. The whole thing just starts to, to unravel right there. And then Moses intercedes for the people. God's about to just smite them all and start over with Moses. And Moses does something very interesting at this point. The prayer he offers up is very important. It's, it, it refers back to uh, when God revealed himself to him in Exodus. It's very, very cool. And then there's the, and the, so after the spies come back, a group of people say, hey, well, we can do it. And so then they go and they get re, re, rebuffed. Uh, so they have an, a failed invasion. And then it talks about various offerings. It talks about the penalty for violating the Sabbath. And this is also a little interesting thing that we won't be able to get to, but uh, there's, there's two people in Scripture. There's uh, uh, the man with the unnamed sin and the sin with the unnamed man. And uh, uh, it looks like those two are related. And so that's part of it in that portion, uh, the one who uh, had violated the Sabbath. And the commandment of tzitzit, or tassels, uh, those things that Jesus wore on the corners of his garments that people touched and were healed. And in fact, when uh, you read through the sending out of the 12 apostles, you'll read about them being sent out, and at the end of that chapter, you'll see that it, many people came to Jesus and they touched, it says he touched the fringe of his garment. As many touched the fringes of the garment, those people were healed. That's tzitzit. So you'll see in this portion, the 12 are sent out. All these things happen, and then tzitzit, and you'll see in Matthew chapter 10, the exact same pattern comes through. So it's very interesting. Okay, you guys ready to hit it? Okay.
Okay, let's do it. So we're sending out the scouts, the apostles. Now, in most Bibles, it doesn't say send for yourself. But that's kind of an important uh, little part in there. It's kind of a word that's just dropped out of our English translation. It says, send for yourself men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one, a chief among them. So this is a leader. Now, these are not the same leaders. These are not the same uh, princes that uh, are in different, another part of uh, numbers in previous weeks that we've talked about. Uh, it says, send for yourself. So who really sent out the, sc the scouts? It says, send for yourself. It's kind of like God saying, look, if you want to send people out, then you're sending them out. Go ahead and send them out. Because God already knows he's given them the land. God already knows they're going to take it. God already knows the land is good. God doesn't need scouts. So this brings into the, the whole thing. Why, why are we sending out scouts? Why do we need to send out scouts to, to search out the land? What's the whole purpose behind this? And so there's these little hints. Send for yourself. God didn't say send them for me. God doesn't need scouts. God already knows. So the whole question is, is why do the people need scouts? Why are the people pushing for this? And why is Moses agreeing to it and thinking it's a good idea? So to spy out the land? Well, we talked about this, about spying and scouting and, and what's really going on. Most uh, translations will say spy, but I like scout or they're taking a tour. So actually, if we get to that word, uh, explore, search out, take a tour of the land. They're going on a tour. It's a tour of the Holy Land, the first one, you know, anyway. Um, so they're, they're going to, to, to search it out. Now, here's something interesting. The Hebrew word for this, guess what, guys? It's tour. <laughs> And that's exactly how you say it. You know how to take a tour in Hebrew? You take a tour. It's the same thing. Same thing in English and Hebrew. So the English word for this is, uh, is tour. Uh, and they're supposed to take, so they were supposed to take a tour of the land. They're, they're supposed to go sightseeing. They're, they're supposed to say, this is over here, this is over there, there's a river there, there's this, that, and, oh, this isn't this wonderful. Look at the wonderful land that God is giving us. Uh, this is the idea behind that. Now, this seems to change <clears throat> because of what happens here following this. So we need to understand that it says right here, to, to take a tour, to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. God is giving it to them, right? That's all the information you should need to know about the land, that God is giving it to them. They should be in the camp. God is giving us the land. Isn't this wonderful? Right? Let's go, let's go have a preview of coming attractions. But there's something else uh, going on, obviously. And he says, send out from each tribe a representative who is a wise leader. Now, this is why you don't really want to call these guys spies in, in the sense of the word that we think of today. It's because these guys were not slouches. These guys were holy. They were righteous. They were wise. And they were, you know... They were battle-tested. They, they were good guys, right? But what happens when good guys start listening to bad advice, when they start listening to bad counsel, when they start listening to people and uh, their mind starts changing a little bit and things, things go bad. Ten of these guys are going to die by the end of this uh, passage, or in this passage, so... So even, that just goes to show you, you know, if you step up to be a leader and you're wise and you're good and you're righteous and, and things are going well, that uh, you can definitely be removed from that position of leadership by uh, not listening to the people rather than to God. So here it is in Deuteronomy. Now this is a cross reference. And so in this passage of scripture, we see that uh, they're being sent out and God says, see, I want you to send these guys out. But in this passage of scripture, Scripture, we get a little bit more information. Uh, this is Moses speaking here. Then all of you came near to me and said, Let us send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. The thing seemed good to me. This is Moses speaking. And I took 12 men from you, one man from each tribe. So what's going on in the passage here in Numbers? Well, it seems like these guys came to Moses. 
Let's explore out the land. Let's see what we do. And Moses is thinking, oh, this is great. Let's, let's do this idea. Um, but there was, a little, there was something that was a little off. There was a little misunderstanding, it seems, between what Moses was thinking and what these leaders and what the people were thinking. Uh, so then you see God say, then, then Moses looks like, because Moses takes everything to God. He, he hears this thing from the people, it seems good to me, so I'm going to take it before God. And God goes, send, send for yourself. You know, you need, if you need to send them, send them, but I don't need to send them. So there's this little hint that not all is well, that God's not just sending people out there, that this wasn't necessarily the thing that should have happened or was supposed to happen, but it is the thing that did happen, and that uh, um, this is the situation that gives us some light on how that worked. So why did it seem good to Moses to do this? Didn't Moses know? that God had already given them the land? Didn't he already know that the land was good? Didn't, wasn't he confident that, I mean, they were being led by a pillar, you know, by day and by night. The glory of God was, was leading them through the, through the wilderness. Didn't, didn't they think that God would still do the same thing and lead them to attack here, do this, go this way, take this out? Did, did they not think that was going to continue on to happen? Did Moses not think that? So, but Moses was thinking, you know, let's get a preview. Preview of coming attractions. Now, I don't know if this is what he was thinking, but it could have been something he was thinking. Let's, let's look at the land, the wonderful land that God is giving us. Let's, let's see what's there. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, let's, let's take a peek at the present, you know, okay, you know, a little bit beforehand. What, what are we getting here? And then, and how should we go about this? So the, the people, these leaders presented to Moses, hey, we should see which cities we should take first, how the, we should go. And yes, the land is given to us, so let's kind of strategize a little bit. And Moses go. Not a bad idea. Let's take a tour. Let's strategize. Let's look at cities. Seemed good to me. He asked God. God seemed to say, well, if you want to go, go. So, hey, it's a green light. So Moses is recounting this to them in Deuteronomy. But was there a difference between what Moses wanted and what the people wanted? It seems to be because of the result. So what did the people want? Though The people seems like they wanted to evaluate the land. Well, what's the difference between previewing and evaluating. Evaluating means making judgments about. Evaluating means, no, this is good, this is better. Evaluating is, is it good or not? Previewing is, it's ours, let's, let's take a preview. Evaluating, you know, so God goes, what do, you, what, what do you need to evaluate? What's there to evaluate? I'm giving it to you. It's kind of like the whole idea, why look a gift horse in the mouth? And, and that means what? You're going to check the horse's teeth? It's a free horse. Who cares what the teeth are like, you know? So not, not to say that the land was like a bad horse or anything like that. Obviously not. It was a good land flowing with milk and honey, and that's going to be proved to them. And so God, when he sends them out, he goes, prove it to yourselves. Go grab some fruit. Go grab some uh, figs. Go grab some grapes, you know. Make sure you bring some back. And they did, which was good. And so their idea was, can we even go about this? Is it doable? Is it good? Is it doable? It seems to be the, the aspect of what the people are kind of putting there. There's another thing I didn't put in the notes that, that, that does seem a bit interesting. And that is, if you were in the wilderness and every day you're being led by the presence and the Spirit of God and you see His glory in the tabernacle and every morning you're fed with manna and the, there's a well... There's a well that Miriam sings. She sings a song. You'll see the song of Miriam in the, in the Bible. The idea was that she would sing this song and water, this well, this rock would follow them through the wilderness and the rock would pop up and water all the people wherever they were. So, I mean, that's what it says. That's why when other scripture says you are the rock, the living water, the rock that goes with me, the rock, my rock. When you're talking about that, it's kind of reference to this rock that Miriam would bring about in the wilderness. And these are supernatural things. These are the things that the people in the wilderness were said to have experienced. And now they're about to go into the land. Maybe they want to know if the land is going to be better or worse than what they were. Maybe they were afraid of a little bit of work, you know, because now you're not going to have this same experience. You're not going to have this spiritual high all the time. You're going to have to come down and make the spiritual meet with the earth.
You know, you have to, you have to combine them. You're kind of like combining heaven and earth together. And then they're going to have to plant crops. And then they're going to have to harvest them. And then they're going to have to bring the offerings. And they're going to have to travel to Jerusalem. And all these things, you know. Like, well, maybe they weren't so, you know, maybe they wanted to stay a little bit. And so maybe that caused them to think, you know what, maybe we don't really want to go into the land right now. And so these things may have played a part. It's an it's interesting thing to think of. Um, another thing is, is that when they know, because Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it like God had asked them to, and God said that you will not enter the land, right? So guess what happens? They go to the land now, where goes with Moses? Well, Moses isn't going in, right? They're going in, but Moses isn't. And so Joshua especially has, has a lot of reason not to, not when he goes in to scout out the land, he has lots of reason to say that, you know what, maybe we shouldn't go in because he loves Moses a lot. And it's a really testament to Joshua that he says what he says about the land because it's God's truth. And that means that Moses will not be with them uh, much longer after that. So there's all of these dynamics kind of going on right here. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who are heads of the people of Israel. Now, if you see something that is obviously, like, obviously redundant, you know, you're going, okay, w what does this mean? Well, this is the idea that these were manly men. They were men's men. They were manly men. I just think of them, manly men, men, anyway. So, it, like the guys at the brawny commercial, I, I don't know. I mean, so they were wise, they were righteous, they were well respected, that's why they were chosen, and they could do battle. So they were, they were mighty in word and deed. I mean, they just didn't do it. So all of them are kind of an equal caliber, but God says something interesting about one of them, and we'll talk about that when we get there. So messengers bearing a message, and this is something to look at when you're looking at Scripture. Uh, when you see that the tribes are named in Scripture, or, and they're put in, into an order, and in your notes in the, in the back, I've got their order, and I've got their meanings, and I've got all that stuff on the last page if, so that you can have that. But the way that they're ordered in Scripture, sometimes God's trying to tell us something like, what, well, what's going on here? Sometimes it's like an encoded message. It's kind of like uh, these guys were, these tribes were picked in this order, and um, when they write this down, I go, oh my goodness, if you just throw in a few extra words, it actually has a, a little message inscribed there. So um, here is, uh, this is just the beginning of the list of all their names. I didn't put all of them on the PowerPoint, but the names of the tribes can make a sentence. And uh, everything in, in capital letters is one of the names in Hebrew. And this is, if you were to read it in English, you could make a sentence like this. Behold a son, hear him, give him praise, for he brings reward, and you will be doubly fruitful. He is the son of my right hand dwelling with us. He will cause you to forget your struggles when he comes as judge. Happy and blessed are those who believe, even with strife, he is our fortune and wealth. And that's the listing of the tribes, and that's the order that they go in. And then the name of the scouts. There's another little message in here. Hear him. He has judged the whole heart. He will redeem me with salvation because he is my deliverance. My God, surely my good fortune, the God of my people is concealed. Though hidden, my God is exalted. So that just gives me chills when you look at that stuff. And you go, wow. You'll see this in the genealogy of Genesis. You'll see this in the, the naming of the 12 tribes in Revelation. It's, it's not just 12 tribes in Revelation. Those, those names all have meanings, and it actually makes a sentence as to who those people are. So who were these people? This is saying that God's kingdom is kind of hidden, like a treasure hidden in a field that you sell all of it and you go get it. The world sees one thing, but you know there's something else. God is concealed on one hand, but in the future he will be revealed to all. So, so this is an idea that these are messengers going out on behalf of the kingdom, doing kingdom business, bringing a kingdom message. So these apostles, these Shaliach, these sent out ones, go bearing a message. They go bearing a message from their tribe and all of Israel, and they go bearing a message on their own. And their message has to do with the Messiah and the redemption because all of this stuff is connected to the land. So when they're going into the land, they're not just evaluating the land. 
They're evaluating the promises of God. They're evaluating the character of God. They're saying, do we want to rely on the character of God or do we want to rely on our own strength? So when they start thinking, uh, I'm not be able to rely on my own strength, then God goes, wait a minute. Haven't you seen my character all this time? So then you'll get the idea of, of what's going on when they come back to give their report. So as this is going out, so these guys were named, but before they go out, Moses changes the name of one of them. You know him as Joshua. Uh, in, in, in their Bible, you'll read in the verse here, it says, these were the names of the men whom Moses sent out to spy out the land. All those ones that I uh, gave that English um, sentence of. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua, or Yehoshua. So Hosea, and there's another Hosea in scripture. He, he wrote the book of what we call Hosea. So Hosea and Hosea are the same name. Uh, Joshua is Hosea with one little letter added to the front of it. So we're going to explore that. Moses had an idea that no good would come of this endeavor. When God said, oh, you go ahead for your sin for yourself, God goes, or Moses is like, in the back of his mind, he could be thinking, wait a minute. Maybe this doesn't mean what I think it means. Maybe this is not what I think it is. Or maybe there's something else going on here. And in fact, there's an idea that their death sentence of these spies was already meted out before they even left the camp. Right? If Moses knew this, it might be a reason why he changed the name of Joshua. But there's other reasons as well. So that Joshua wouldn't be named among the rest. So he knew that Hosea would be at risk. Not only would he be at risk because God was not pleased with this whole thing, but the people really wanted it, and Moses thought maybe some good could come of it, perhaps. But he knew that the other, the other scouts may try and pressure Joshua to change his opinion about the land, or, or something might happen that uh, would, would influence or affect him. Or maybe this whole thing, this whole situation where these guys are evaluating the land to say whether we could go in it or not would come back on Joshua or on Hosea some way. And so uh, Moses wanted to give him something extra to go into the land with. And whenever you see a name change in scripture, it usually goes from uh, one of a more worldly connection to a more heavenly connection so that you know that Jacob... Uh, was, had his name changed to Yisrael, or Israel. And I don't, but you don't know that he had another name change as well. And the other name change, he went from Yis, Israel to Jeshurun, or Yeshurun. And every time, he's gone up a level spiritually. So Moses is changing Josh, uh, na the name to Joshua, and you can see there's another, an added level of, of spirituality added on to his name. So Moses changes his name from Hosea to Yehoshua. Hosea means he saves, or he will save. That's what Hosea means. Yehoshua means that Yehovah will save. yod -Heh -Vav -Heh will save. So he says you cannot. Um, well, here, we'll get that in a sec. This is also the name Yeshua. So if you want to know Yehoshua and Yeshua, basically the same name. Because if you say... Uh, Yeshua fast, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. It's just a really easy transition. So Yeshua and Yeshua are the same name. And that is who we know as Jesus. So the same thing that applies to Joshua with the, the meaning of his name is the same thing that applies to Jesus with his name. They're the same name. So this signifies that salvation comes from Yehovah, and that one cannot be saved out of one's own strength. It's like Moses knew that out of uh, Hosea's own strength, he would not be able to save himself from the perils of this journey. Uh, spiritual perils. I don't think Moses was one bit worried that Joshua was getting to get into a, a struggle, a physical struggle that he could not, uh, you know, handle. You know, even though we'll see who's in the land, there are giants in the land. It's, it's, it's crazy. But but the more pressing need for Hosea was that he had God, that he had the strength of God, and that he knew God was his salvation. And so Moses grants him this extra, this extra maybe arm of the Lord, because the Yud is an arm. So by the arm of the Lord, by the arm of Yehovah, that's what saves. And Moses wanted to have that picture in Hosea's mind. So 
Joshua goes through a name change from Hosea to Joshua, or Hosea to Joshua, if you're going to say it in English. So here's what they're going to do. They're going to go up through the Negev, and these are the things. See if the people are strong or weak. Few or many. Is the land good or bad? Are the cities strongholds or camps? Right? Do they have fortified walls? Is the land rich or poor? Is there a tree or not? Now it says trees in most versions, but actually in the Hebrew it just says a tree. And there's a prophetic significance. Could be about that. It's interesting, but uh, kind of a sidetrack. So, and to bring back some of the fruit of the land. So these, these are the mission objectives. Now, you're going to see that what the majority thinks are problems, the minority thinks are opportunities, right? And so the whole thing is, is are the people strong or weak? Now, what does that mean? Does that mean physically strong or weak? It doesn't matter how physically strong. If they're spiritually weak, you know, nothing's going to save them, right? So are you looking through this with the Yehoshua lens, the, the God is salvation lens? Are you looking for it through with the, the Hoshea lens, the he saves lens? Like who's the he? Is it me? Is it God? We don't know. But with Yehoshua, with uh, Joshua, we know that God has been entered in. So then we, the, these scouts are supposed to be looking at this through God-centered eyes. And so what looks obvious should be crossed out as being, that's not it, right at all. What the spiritual thing, what is behind that should be the thing that they're looking for. And this gives the idea for discernment for us, right? We could say, you know, when we're making decisions, when we're looking at situations, when we're seeing how things are, are we looking at it through God-centered eyes or are we looking at what looks obvious in, in, to other humans, right? Are we looking at uh, some, something that looks strong physically and go, oh, I don't know if we can ever do that. Are we looking at... Uh, at situations and going, well, we don't have this, we don't have this, we don't have, then I, I don't know. The whole question is, is God behind it? Is he leading you that way? Has he given it to you? In, in that case, you don't ask such stupid questions. You just forge ahead, right? And so when you know that your cause is right and it's biblically accurate and God has, has a promise in scripture that you're able to, to go out and take hold of, then you know that you shouldn't be asking all these silly questions. You know, is it going to be, is it going to be physically draining? Is it, you know, do I have enough money? Or, you know, whatever might come into your mind. You should be looking at what is, what is behind. What is the spiritual implication of that? Oh, think about this. So bring back some of the fruit of the land. That's kind of like, that's, it's the first fruits in a, in a way. It's, they're going to bring out the first fruits of the land. It's, that's an interesting little side note there. So now they come back and they're going to give their report. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. Sorry. And they came to Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back the word to them and all, to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They said that these grapes were as big as melons. They put them on a pole and it took two guys to haul these things back. So there's this idea that these guys were sent out two by two because you have Joshua and Caleb had the same story. Yeah, you have two of these guys bringing things back on a pole. It doesn't say that they were sent out two by two, but, it, but there's strong indications that it was two by two. And we know that's how Jesus sent people out as well, two by two. And he told them, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Woo! Preview of coming events. Good deal. Yeah? Well, this just goes to show you that when you're about to do something, uh, when you're about to lay down the boom, you give a little bit of positive, and then here comes the rest. So what is the rest? However, what do you mean however? We should, we should have stopped at the first one. It's true. God gave us the land. Here it is. Let's go. Ah, oh, but there's a however. Oh, my goodness. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, physically strong. We know that they were spiritually weak because God was driving them out of the land for their sins. And the cities are fortified and very large. Ooh, scary, fortified, large cities. There's lots of people. They're strong. They live behind massive amounts of baked brick and stone. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Who are the descendants of Anak? The Amalekites dwell on the land in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and all along the Jordan. 
Look at all those peoples we got to conquer. It's not like we just go in there and there's one people. They've got all these peoples. Well, who are the descendants of Anak? The descendants of Anak are giants. Are giants, and we're going to see. And so this is meant to strike terror in the hearts of the people. We can't do it. Forget it. But guess what? Caleb, Caleb is sitting there, and he can't stand it anymore. He's like, going, what are you guys doing? I, I agree with the first part, but now you've gone off the rails. He says, he says, can't, can't quiet the people, because obviously there's an uproar. They say all these things, and as soon as they say the sons of Anak, all pandemonium breaks loose, and forget about it. Hey, we can't do this. But Caleb gets them all quieted down. He says, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. So everything negative that they just said, Caleb does not have the same eyes that they do. Caleb, maybe Caleb is thinking this. I can't jump into his head, but think about it this way. There's many peoples in the land. What does that mean? That the land is divided. There's different religions. There's different cultures. There's different kings. There's war. And, and it's not a land where it's just like open walls. Every city is fortified. Well, who are they fortified against? They weren't fortified against Israel. They're fortified against each other, which means that they're divided. And they might be strong, but they're, they haven't been out in the wilderness They've been living in their fat cities with all this stuff. I mean, we're hardened. We're battle hardened. We can go in there. We can divide. We can conquer. They're spiritually dead. That God has given us the land. We can surely do this. I mean, Caleb is just thinking, isn't it obvious to the rest of you? But they were looking through different eyes than Caleb was. Caleb was righteous. And let's see here. So where other people see defeat all around, Caleb's going, this is, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. I can hardly wait. Unfortunately, or fortunately, either way you look at it, Caleb's going to have to wait another 38 years to take, to take a Hebron or Hebron. And so, um, but amazingly enough, he, he basically stays in the same shape for those 38 years. Can you imagine? No midlife crisis for Caleb. He's 80 years old, and he's as fit as he was at 40. <laughs> so, so there are many peoples. Their cities are fortified. There's no national unity there, ripe to be picked off one by one. Caleb goes, we can take that city, and then we'll take that city, and then we'll take that city. But then these guys go, well, we weren't finished yet, Caleb. Pipe down over there. So whenever you bring up something spiritual with people who have got a worldly mindset, you always get shot down every single time. You're going to get shot down. It's going to happen. Why? Because they're not looking at the situation with the same eyes that you are. And in fact, this goes to show that most of the time the people arrayed against you are in the majority. How many times have we been cowed by the majority? Well, all those people think that. It must not be true. <sighs> what, it, it, it's, not, it's not true because they've got different eyes. They don't have God's eyes on the situation. They have their own eyes on the situation. What do they know from Adam? Right? So, so if you are standing on God's word and you're right and the majority is wrong, fear not. Fear not. You can be confident that God is on your side if you're standing on his word, if you're standing up for him, if you're standing up for his promises, if you're standing up for his character, for anything. If someone says, oh, you follow that stupid rule book, you know, it's got some stupid things in it. You, you really believe all that? You say, yeah. Why do you say that? Well, because it's God's divine instructions for living. If there were human instructions for living, you'd understand the whole thing. But they're divine instructions for living. That means that it t says what's good and what's bad. And God decided what was good and bad, not me. They're divine instructions. So, here they continue on with the, with the bad report. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are physically. So they brought the people of Israel a bad report. They spoke evil things about the land. Uh, and they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. It means you go in there, you're going to be eaten alive. Forget it. And all the people that saw it are, off, are of great height. And we saw the Nephilim, the fallen ones. Right, that's what Nephilim means, fallen ones. The sons of Anak, giants, who come from the Nephilim, descended from. Right, that's it, out of Genesis 6-4. That's what they're talking about. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. So 
You might say, well, in the physical, you know, these guys got a point. Goliath was nine feet tall. Og of Bashan was 13. Uh, Gilgal, Og of Bashan was there. They said his, he was 13 feet, 13 feet tall. That's two of me. You stand me up on my head and there's another foot. That's 13 feet tall. Can you imagine that? And was, we're not talking about somebody with a genetic uh, disability, you know, that as they just keep growing and they're kind of on a crutch. And No, this guy was meaty, he was strong, and he could rip your head off and, and, and chew you out and spit, spit you out for breakfast, right? That was Og of Bashan. Joshua took that guy out. <laughs> Joshua might have even been shorter than me. I don't know. But you see what I'm saying? That there were giants in the land. The Bible describes these giants in the land. And so the spies think they've got a really good case. Right? And in the natural, we'd say, yeah, they got a good case. And all the people of Israel said, yeah, they got a good case. But they were speaking evil about the land that God was giving to them. They got there. And so many times when you get a gift from God, you might think that, oh my goodness, what's God doing here? I can't do anything with this. He said he was going to promise me this, and, and now there's all these obstacles I've got to overcome. <laughs> yeah. But the obstacles are nothing to God. God didn't grow like little bitty short arms in the time when he saved your soul from hell, and he brought you into his promises. You know, he didn't... No, he can still act and move, and he's the God of the universe. If we knew how big God was, if we knew what his plan really was, we wouldn't ask such silly questions. So what happened at the end of chapter 12? Now, this is something, right? At the end of chapter 12, I'm going back from before all of this happened. What happened back there? You, you want to flip back and learn, or see, Miriam spoke against the wife of Moses to Aaron, and she became white with leprosy. And this is, and then she had to, and then, you know, Moses was standing there and he prayed for her and she was healed right away, but she still had to go stay outside the camp for seven days. And they all waited for her. They all waited for her until she could rejoin the camp before they moved on. This, not, I'm not saying that this chronologically happened right before uh, they were going to send out the, the scouts. But what I'm saying is, is that in, in the way that it's laid out, the way that God lays out Scripture, this is the thing that proceed, This is the story that proceed, uh, immediately precedes what's happening here, and it's because God wants to make a connection. And the connection is, is that the evil speech began with Miriam, but it didn't seem to end there. And it started. It started with her on a high level, and it went through the leadership. And it, after all was said, it infected the entire camp. So. This is the idea that the, the negative things you say against God or his word or the negative things that you say about other people or other people trying to serve God or, or the grumbling, the murmuring, the complaining and other things that happened um, have a devastating effect. So God's saying it happened here and even though it was taken care of and she was, then it started to infiltrate the leadership and then it went to the, all the whole people until everyone was filled with unbelief. They didn't enter the land. It wasn't, they didn't enter the land not because they sent out scouts, not because, not because they, they didn't know how to walk with God. They didn't enter the land because they didn't, be, they didn't believe. It says unbelief. And there's a parallel passage in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 3, and, it, and, it, and the author is explaining to us that they didn't enter in because of their unbelief. They died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And this is a warning to us to believe the promises of God and the one who he sent because we don't want to die in the wilderness because of unbelief, do we? So there's that connection you can, you can look through. So there's an outcry, 14, 1 through 10. Then all the creation, uh, congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Now, why would they have wanted to die in Egypt or the wilderness? I mean, is it, why is it preferable to die outside the land than inside the land? Well, it's because they were afraid for their wives or children. It says that the land devours them up. And that means that their wives would be ravaged and their children would be sacrificed or thrown into slavery. And, and that's why they thought, yeah, it would be better to be back in Egypt. And so they wanted to choose another leader. <laughs> Look at this, Moses. You have led us to a dead end. Let's choose somebody else and go. And Joshua and Caleb try to sway the people. Right? So the people picked up stones to stone them. <laughs> yeah? Does that make sense? 
There's Jesus trying to explain to people that he's the Messiah and the kingdom has come, and what do they do? They pick up stones to stone them. Here's Joshua and Caleb out there trying to tell them that we can surely take the land. This is the kingdom that God has promised us. Let's go. And they pick up stones to stone them. You can see some parallels, right? So the glory, so as soon as they start doing this, the glory of God just fills the tabernacle. And they all like, and they're like, and then he starts taking to Moses and goes, you want for me? I should take care of this for you, you know? Uh, and uh, Moses says no. And he prays this prayer. So the Lord says, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? And in spite of all the signs that I have done among them, how many signs did Jesus do in the wilderness? How many signs did Jesus do in the land? They didn't believe he was the Messiah. After all the signs, they still didn't believe him. They still wanted to stone him. Interesting, right? So God tells Moses he will destroy them. Moses prays for the people. And so what the prayer that Moses prays for the people, it's in your notes, it's in Exodus. It is the 13 attributes of God. God is righteous. And, and uh, well, let's see, let's just go there. We got a little bit of time. Well, I'm going a little long. What is it, Exodus 36? I cut off half of what I was going to say. Can you believe it? I think it's Exodus 36. So God puts Moses in a, in, in a cliff, and he goes through them, and he says... And he says 13 attributes. It's called the, it's the 13 attributes of God. And he reveals himself to him. Oh, I'm trying to think. Was it thir- What's in the notes? What's the reference in the notes? Is it Exodus 26? Hmm. Well, here, let's just go to Numbers. It's in Numbers too. The cross reference is in the notes. Let me just... Um, okay, yeah, that's it. So he prays this. So God reveals himself to him, and then Moses says, okay, well, this is your character. This is who you are. And I think God says this stuff to Moses just to prove again, gives Moses an opportunity to prove himself again. Of course, Moses is not going to say, oh, yeah, kill all these people. Start over with me. That would be very prideful. Moses would never do that. Uh, But instead, he he gives this uh, other reaction here when he says, for, o Lord, you are seen face to face, and your cloud says over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud. And so he says, you see them face to face. What, what did Moses ask when he asked to see God? He said, let me see you face to face. And God says, you can't see me and live, but I tell you what, my glory is going to pass, and when you see, you'll see the after effects. And as Moses is seeing the after effects of God, this is what's said. He says, I am the Lord who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. So God, so he's using that same thing that God showed him in interceding on behalf of the people. So when does God relent and forgive when you bring up his character, when you bring up who he is, when you say you are a loving, compassionate, gracious, and kind God, and I'm throwing myself at the mercy, and you've forgiven me up to now, and continue to forgive me, God relents. But he does not clear the guilty, which means what? There are still consequences for the actions. They didn't just get to go into the land after this. God forgave them, but they, had to, but they said, but then the reality was going to happen, that they wouldn't be able to go into the land for 40 years, basically. From the time they left Egypt, it'd be 40 years before they entered the land. And God, for every day, they went on a 40-day tour, 40 years to get back in the land. So one year for each day that they were on tour, there was a year of judgment against them. They go, why didn't we just go for seven? (laughs) So God judges them, and they will not enter the land, and in 40 years, the next generation will enter the land, and that you'll see in Joshua chapter 2. Now, Joshua also sends out scouts. But there's a totally different outcome, right? So it's like maybe Joshua learned something of, from the first time. He didn't send them to the whole land. He sent them to one city. He goes, this is the city we're going to first. Go scout it out. Right? And then out of that, we have uh, 
uh, Rahab, the harlot, who was saved out of that. It's a very interesting prophetic picture. So the rejection of the land is the same as the rejection of God's kingdom. God did many miracles through Moses, and the people still rejected him as the leader. So when Jesus comes and he offers the kingdom, right, and they reject it, it's, it's tied. The 12 apostles, the 12 sent out ones, and they're tied together. It's, it's about the kingdom of God. So God also did many miracles through Jesus, and he was still rejected as the Messiah. And so they grumbled and complained against Moses. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? They grumbled and complained against Jesus. He's not doing this. He's not doing that. And that generation did not inherit the kingdom. And you'll see Jesus saying, this generation will not inherit the kingdom of God. What do you think he's referring to? Sometimes they think that, they think that it means that people right there, this generation, like the one standing in front of them. But it seems to be the same thing that's happening back there in Numbers He's saying that God's saying this generation shall not enter and it's going to take 40 years and then the next one will. And Jesus is saying this generation, why? Because they're doing the same thing to me that they did all those years ago. So how long is this generation? Well, if it's 2,000 years, because we're about 2,000 years right now, that's 40 times 50. 50 is a jubilee year. 40 times 50, 2,000. Which might be another indication that he's soon to return because the 40 jubilees is almost up. So, it's just an interesting thing. I don't know that if that's the case or not. But what I do know is that God uses these things and they cycle over and over again. So these things, you know, maybe you pay attention to a little bit. And so you can cross-reference Hebrews chapter 3 if you want to do a little further study on, on how all that works together. Now you'll have a really good idea about what Hebrews chapter 3 is all about. So we cannot break faith with God. We cannot doubt Him right? I know we're, and this is the 4th of July, and happy birthday USA, go America, right? But did God give us this land or not? Did we found this nation based on godly principles and on the Bible? Was Deuteronomy not the most quoted book of our founding fathers? Were there not a lot of believers that believed that God led them to this land so that we could worship him, right? So can we doubt? There might be people out there that's, and there might be laws out there, and there might be all this. There's giants, there's spiritual giants in the land. That, but are we going to sit there and go, oh, no, we can't, we can't do it? No. It's up to us to be strong and courageous and to go forward, to do what's right. Now, whether we turn this thing around or not, I don't know. But what I do know is that we are not going to lose if we stand on God's principles and if we stand on his word. We're, just, we're not going to lose. Even if the world sees and thinks that we've lost, that we'll gain the kingdom, and that's all that we ever needed anyway. So... We cannot speak against God or his plans. Have you ever had people out and they're going like, oh, well, why is God doing this to me? I, I've got news for all of us. God is not doing anything to any of us. God is not up there with a the stick going, you've disobeyed me. It's not, this is not what he's doing. What he's doing is, what he's doing is you're reaping, we are reaping the consequences of our own actions. Why is the country in the state it's in? Is it God's judgment against the nation? No, we're reaping the consequences of turning our back on him. We're reaping the consequences of taking prayer out of school. We're reaping the consequences of taking the Ten Commandments out of our public places. We're reaping the consequences of, of letting all the secularism flourish. We're reaping the consequences of what our eyes see, what our, what our mouths speak, and we're reaping the consequences of those things. Now, God is all faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if we return to him and repent and we change our ways. So you have to turn, you have to repent, start walking that way, and then you actually have to change. You can't just pray about change, you actually have to change. You can't just say that you're going to walk after God, you actually have to do it, right? <clears throat> so evil speech will destroy the work of God. Don't repay evil for evil. Now, we all like to say things about this or that or the other person or this or that or the other thing, but we cannot have evil speech about what God's doing, his work, or the people involved in it. We just can't do it because evil speech will destroy the work of God. It will destroy the vision of the kingdom that I said before. It will spiritually blind people to the actual truth of what's going on. So evil speech must be rid from our lips. As this has shown us, it started with Miriam, it went through the leadership, and it went through all Israel, and it says we can't do it. What happens in our 
congregations, in our nation, in our church. Well, we have people saying, well, God's judging us, and there's nothing we can do, and it's too late, and, uh, you know, and why did God do this? Why did he lead us here, and what's going... No. No. We need to take personal responsibility and turn this thing around. Everybody needs to focus on themselves, start doing what's right, and then start inviting other people to come and do it as well. Invite people. Invite people to church. Invite people to the Bible. Invite people to pray. Just always be inviting. Here, come, share. Right? Evil speech, negative thoughts, murmuring, grumbling, all work together to produce unbelief. You end up with what goes on in Hebrews chapter 3, dying in the wilderness. And we need to realize that the enemy has been given over into our hands. When Jesus died on the cross, the kingdom was instituted. Uh, the, the restored kingdom, the one but whereby which anyone through the blood of the Messiah could enter in and begin a relationship, a, a walk with God. And so the enemy, which is death, has been slain. Because you follow after the Lord, there's no death. The promised land is a reality. The kingdom of God is a reality. In fact, the kingdom of God is more real than the chairs you're sitting in right now. But you don't see it. It's hidden and concealed. You pray. You don't even know what your prayers do. They echo through the heavens. And your sin, you don't know what your sin does. It echoes through the universe. It destroys things. It wrecks a picture that will never be the same again. Right? And so, but fortunately, your good things are more powerful than your bad things. And you can correct all the bad things that you do, right? By turning your heart to God and going and making restitution, repairing all this other stuff. So we need to realize that the enemy has been given out of our hands. The spiritual reality of the kingdom is a real thing. The things that you do on this earth reflect what happens for eternity, and that's the promised land. You might say, it's hard. It's hard. I don't understand. We do this, what does that mean? We, do, we pray, what does that mean? We read our Bible. You know, Every second you read your Bible, there's God smiling up in heaven at you. Every second that you, you give charity or you do something good for somebody else, God counts that and goes, this is wonderful, right? And then you're restoring the universe. Those things echo through eternity. That's why you want to do more and more of them. So the land God promised is ours. Not only this nation, right, but the nation to come, the, the kingdom of Israel that will reign on the earth through the Messiah from Jerusalem. That's what's going to happen. So is that enough? Should we cut it off there? All right. Come to my birthday. We'll talk more. It'll be fun. Okay. Let's pray, and we're going we're gonna, to um, pay God some respect. So we need to trust God with our actions and take it. Not only do we pray, but we back up those prayers with actions, and we come the light, the little lights out in the nation of the world that will someday congregate from Jerusalem and shine from there. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word, for the lessons that it teaches us. I pray that we would be able to take them, take hold of them, and put them into practice in our lives, that we would be able to uh, stop our own doubts and faithlessness and have faith in your plan, have faith in who you are, and have faith that you are bringing all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And we pray all these things to you, our Father, in the name of our Messiah, our Lord Jesus. Amen.